Hi, everybody. Welcome to the March 2020 edition of the Third Fridays podcast. My guest today is Lois Attorney Andrea Abudaya. Welcome back to the show. Happy to be here, Christian. So, uh, for many people uh, that follow our webinar series, they saw a very, very new and up-to-date current event style webinar earlier this month on the coronavirus and COVID-19. Anything happened since then? I think it was, what, uh, the the first or second Monday? I think things have happened. Yes, for sure. Yeah. uh, Actually, the distance between us does not really, like, abide by social distancing rules, but are we okay? I think so. So far, no complaints on my end, at least. Right. Me neither. I think uh, this is just going to be okay for now. Uh, But since then, right, uh, the world around us has kind of uh, changed. Uh, It seems like every day or every hour. Mm -hmm. And the board is no different, right? So uh, we have a, I guess, a quote-unquote response from the board as to what they plan to do in response to or really in anticipation of d- different issues that might be happening at, at hearings as we speak, right? They actually listed about nine or ten things. Um, so we're going to go over the, all of them and discuss them in a way that uh, can provide some practical advice to our clients. Um, I think the first place to start off with is actually their first bullet point with virtual hearings, where they actually say... The board will conduct all hearings remotely through virtual hearings and, I guess, their capability. So does that change anything for us? Honestly, no. We've been doing exclusively virtual hearings for ever since they've been available. Um, We go to court very rarely, only in situations where we have a witness that has to show up in person. But we've been telling our witnesses to appear virtually We've been appearing virtually. The judges are used to us doing so. And I think we have a pretty good system set up where we get all of our documentation into the board's file in anticipation to the hearings so that we can ensure that there's no delays in whatever relief we're seeking. So (laughs) honestly, for us, I don't think it's going to change life very much. But I know that for some other people, they have a little bit of catching up to do. Yeah, I I would agree. I think that it's... uh, I don't want to say it's it's a nice development. Obviously, things are, are impacting uh, people around us in, in a negative way. But ultimately, uh, the fact that we have been equipped to handle this kind of development uh, and really not change our status quo, still provide the same customized service, has been uh, kind of a justification for our initial uh, position within the industry. But essentially... If we can expect everyone to appear virtually, I think we need to recognize any type of hearing that requires an in-person aspect, whether it be uh, surveillance or uh, the introduction of evidence. They do note that all the evidence should be filed uh, two days prior to the hearing so that it can be of use to each party. Right, uh, and they actually reference DVDs and other materials that they wish to reference at the hearing. It should be mailed to the board and opposing parties within two days of introducing it at the hearing. There's also the instant upload function that we've been utilizing, I believe, to our advantage as well. So if we have paper documentation that we need to submit, we do know how to get it there. Even if it's obtained last minute, we just need to make sure we have it before the hearing so that we can reference to it and make sure that there's no delays. Great point, great point. That was actually a a suggestion that they made in their virtual hearing guidelines years ago, a couple of years ago when they came out with this. Uh, Use the web upload function, try to get it five days before each hearing so that everybody has a chance to review it. Well, the second thing that the board looked at is the 90-day requirement for medical evidence. Now, what what does this mean? What What do claimants have to do? with respect to this requirement. The one 
obligation that claimants have in order to maintain their awards is to go to the doctor every 90 days. That's every three months. Right, four it's, times a year. <laughs> it's not a heavy burden. But um, in case we weren't clear as to who the board was trying to favor, they have softened this requirement. The claimants now can uh, submit an affidavit indicating that they are unable to comply with this because of the coronavirus uh, situation and their benefits would not be suspended. Yeah, uh, two interesting things here is is that uh, these types of hearings where uh, defense will raise stale medical are usually brought forth by the filing of an RFA-2, right? So I think the important takeaway here from uh, employer carrier side is that when we're doing that, to be prepared for this opposing argument, oh, I couldn't see my doctor because of the coronavirus. So... Uh, what other alternate alternate reasons can we provide to suspend benefits? Uh, are there uh, is there an IME? Uh, is there some kind of uh, records review, which we'll get into later? You know, can can a records review be used to uh, provide a no disability report in lieu of a physical exam? I mean, the answer is always yes, but we face those credibility issues. And I think in this circumstance. If a claimant is going to use the coronavirus as a reason not to go to their doctor, then I actually think a records review from an uh, IME doctor commenting on disability can have more weight than usual. And even if the records review didn't see the claimant, it would at least force the issue into depositions. And we're, we've got really good results on depositions. We get concessions from claimant's doctors regarding the issue of degree of disability. We get concessions regarding the need for further treatment, and we can use that to leverage our position to raise either the issue of labor market attachment, the issue of permanency, or at the very least, the temporary suspension of benefits to um, have our position on settlement be a little bit more, um, have a little bit more leverage when negotiating right. settlement with our adversary. Right. I know that you specifically have been contacted by some of our adversaries wondering why am I doing this kind of thing? Uh, and I always think that that means that we're winning, right? Like that means we're doing our job, uh, being the uh, zealous advocate for our clients. Uh, you know, stipulating to tentative rates does not benefit the employer uh, unless it's a certain exception, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, any any time, you know, we can ruffle the feathers of our adversaries, make them do a little bit more work to achieve the goals that they set out for their, themselves in a claim, we're actually reaching our own goal, right? Because our own goal is a settlement, a closure, uh, because that is the best type of file. And, you know, touching upon that, I mean, the next bullet point that the, the, the board has in their COVID response is the failure to attend an IME uh, is typically excused where the refusal to submit is reasonable. And when they say if a claimant cannot appear at a scheduled IME due to the coronavirus outbreak, he or she should let his or her attorney know and notify the IME doctor and the board by email or by letter to the board's centralized mailing address. The interesting thing here is I would imagine most claimants not doing this, but instead bringing this up at a hearing. Yes. So I think the, the, the nice rebuttal argument is to say that the board has provided guidelines made them aware to everybody that if this is the reason, then let us know beforehand so we're not wasting our time and resources in litigation. Uh, if it can be verified that your reason for not attending an exam uh, is due to this outbreak, then tell us ahead of time. And if they fail to do so, I think that even if at the hearing the judge is unpersuaded and tries to take a more lenient position, it's an issue that we can bring up on appeal, which again, this would at least give us an opportunity to temporarily suspend benefits and explore other avenues to close down the case. Yeah. Um, it's, it's certainly something, something that we have to be aware of, right? Uh, I think that with statewide curfews, statewide uh, policies on working from home, we, we know, have to know that some employers may be advising claimants to stay home mm -hmm. uh, as a precautionary measure then we also can't turn around and say, well, you should have attended this IME. I think we have to be a little bit 
more careful and, and uh, specific when we choose to make those arguments uh, as they may affect uh, or conflict with our employer's directives outside of the workers' compensation world. I do still think, though, that the board makes it very clear that if the claimant is canceling due to this reason, they have to cancel it, not just not show up. If they don't show up, no-show letters should still go out, and we should still have um, our position be heard because it's not a difficult burden to pick up the phone and say, hey, I can't come. Yeah, and I think a good, uh, a good a bit of evidence to, to help that argument would be you know, how much are we paying for a no-show exam right. as opposed to having uh, a, cancel, a, sh- a smaller cancellation fee issued you know, if proper notice is given. I think that's, that's a nice uh, way to kind of tie it up. But uh, the next thing the board goes into is for uh, a response to a C-4 authorization request. Now, we know that this form uh, is typically... Uh, denied with the accompaniment of medical evidence in rebuttal, whereas the MG2 variance doesn't necessarily require an IME or a records review. It can be denied strictly on burden of proof. Uh, This roundabout way where I guess based on the filing of a piece of paper, the specific piece of paper to uh, treatment for a specific body part costing a specific amount and not within the medical treatment guidelines puts us in a position of having to produce an IME report. So this is where the board goes into uh, the conflicting second opinion uh, coming from a records review, right? Because it says they don't have the authority to waive the statutory requirement to produce a timely conflicting medical opinion under Section 13A5. They note that the existing law allows for the conflicting opinion to be based on a records review instead of an in-person examination. And I think... That's where we can make our headway with these reports is to say they're telling us to go do this, right? We're not choosing to do it to save money or to produce a a doctor that's not credible, uh, which is sometimes the the feedback we get from judges uh, when we try to defend claims on records reviews, Uh, notwithstanding the fact that these deadlines are so abhorrent and like, you know, 30 days to, to, you know, get an exam, uh, in in any kind of time frame, let alone summer, let alone holidays, all, all and now we have a, an outbreak here. Um, I think that records reviews can be useful for this limited circumstance, uh, while also leaning on these guidelines. I, I agree. The records reviews um, regarding treatment authorizations have been useful in the past. Not as useful as a full exam, but. In these situations when the board has already indicated that they will consider records review instead of in-person examinations, we can also make the argument that we are being put in this position and appropriate weight should be put on this doctor's credibility. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. I think that keep, keeping yourself aware of where we are uh, it can always help. Uh, but before we move on from that, uh, I mean, it looks like a lot of the, these things have to do with attendance at IMEs. I don't want to skip over uh, the section, uh, rather short section, on telemedicine that the board uh, included in their response. Uh, and I'm, I'm really interested into what this uh, is going to result in. But essentially, it says that the board is set to issue an emergency regulation on telemedicine, which will be effective for 90 days upon adoption. Information will be provided on the board website and providing to all subscribing stakeholders. Now, telemedicine uh, is certainly approved in the state of New York, yeah. but I think the issue really is, you know, is your telemedicine doctor going to be credible if we go to trial? And also, is your telemedicine doctor going to allow for payment within the New York fee schedule? Uh, certainly... I'm I'm interested to see what this means because I would imagine that the board is typically not pre is not they're not they're not predisposed to to accepting telemedicine uh, if we have to go to trial and I think our clients are aware of that but certainly if we can allow for an alternate uh, way to provide care one that uh, you know is helpful not only in the context of workers' compensation but in our situation, right? Like, you know, I've read a lot of articles about how, you know, if you don't feel, if you don't feel great, you know, you don't, uh, the first thing isn't necessarily to go to the emergency room where you can infect other people, right? You know, 
if telemedicine is available, if your doctor can be available by phone, you know, it, it seems like that is actually more helpful to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. So I, I, I don't know. What do, you, what do you think? Do you think it has any kind of application, telemedicine, to workers' compensation? I think, okay, in my opinion, telemedicine is going to have pretty much the same weight as a peer review right. or as a records review with the added bonus of uh, an in-person interview, right? Because a doctor can't perform an examination right. over video. But they can have a conversation with the client, the claimant. They can have the claimant perform certain activities or sort of motions. Mm -hmm. And they can perform casual observations. And part of me feels that maybe the claimant would have their guard a little bit down. They might move a little bit more freely if they're via video for the judge, uh, for the doctor. Um, if it's just a phone interview, however, I do think it has a more limited application. Yeah, I, I, I think... Connecting it to a records review is certainly fair, uh, but if it could be better than a records review, right? Like you mentioned, being able to view the claimant. Mm -hmm. I'm also thinking too. You know, if if it if there is video conferencing between claimant and doctor, I mean, can that video be saved? Can we use that as evidence to introduce for other issues in, in a in a trial or, or throughout the life of a claim? I, I'm very interested in that. I think it would be fair to say that we might be able to do that as long as we give the claimant proper notice that it's being recorded. Uh, because if we include in the notice the claimant that the doctor will examine you, it will be via teleconference, it will be av available via video, the video will be saved and served on all parties for further adjudication of uh, the claim, the claimant might uh, behave in a different manner, you know, he or she might be able to perform certain motions. We see it all the time in our IMEs where the claimant can't move at all during examination, but when they're being observed or they're distracted, all of a sudden they can move their necks, they can move their arms, they can move their legs in a more free fashion. So there, there might be a benefit to doing the telemedicine in conjunction with a records review. Right. Uh, so going along that path, right, before, uh, you know, I guess another bullet point having to do with IMEs, this, this uh, one having to do with controverted claims in the expedited hearing process, right? Well, Regulation 300.3a typically requires that an IME report be filed three days prior to the trial. And essentially, because it's now a timeline-specific uh, issue within our world, uh, the board has said that the carrier can request that the judge excuse the lateness and allow additional time. The request must be in the form of the affidavit as required or it will not be considered. That really doesn't change anything, right? If, if we need an extension on an IME in a controverted case on the expedited hearing calendar, we have to file an affidavit explaining the reasons why uh, an extension should be granted. But... I think with this particular case or, or this world now, we have to mention something about the coronavirus impacting uh, the IME's inability to examine within a reasonable amount of time. Right. We, and it, I don't think it has to be as specific as the doctor had an infection or had to quarantine himself. It could just be mention of the lack of availability of doctors or a lack of availability of appointments because of the coronavirus situation. Yeah, and, you know, uh, to make it even more current events, uh, I just had a conversation with one of our paralegals uh, maybe about an hour ago where uh, we were trying to schedule depositions on a different case, and through the conversation of scheduling the deposition with uh, the IME vendor, we learned that uh, Dr. X or Dr. Y is typically not going to be available for exams because of this outbreak, right? So it's almost like knowing that in advance will allow us to say, okay, put this as part of our affidavit because Dr. Smith or Dr. Jones has uh, not has been able to has not been able to be available to physically examine a claimant due to concerns regarding the coronavirus. That would make the extension request almost undeniable, right? If we can show that we have contacted some doctors and we know that they are unavailable for examination because of this specific issue. Absolutely. I mean, I think that going back to what we said about uh, other scheduling and timeline issues, if we make that affidavit based on a doctor's inability to physically examine a claimant, 
and it's correctly because of the coronavirus outbreak, and it's denied by the law judge, like the extension request, I mean, I just have to hold up this piece of paper on appeal, right? I mean, to say, like, this, you, you allowed us to do this, but if the law judge is denying that, then I'm sorry, we have to maintain our con- controversy here, and you have to remand the case right. for an IME doctor to review the claimant. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, but as we move along to depositions... Right, the board says it is anticipated anticipated that there will be problems with scheduling that uh, depositions of medical witnesses that are caused by the coronavirus outbreak, centered around the limited availability of the medical witnesses. Requests for extension of time that are necessitated by these difficulties should include a description of the situation. So it's like more or less the same thing. Yeah. The only thing I can imagine, though, is that you know, hashtag social distancing doesn't really apply to telephonic appearances right like we're not requiring the doctor to appear in our office or the claimant's attorney's office or the board no but there is an excuse to be had there right if the doctor is actually sick or if the doctor is unable to come to his office to pick up his records we don't want a doctor to be testifying um, based on their independent recollection which is usually very very vague right uh, so if the doctor can articulate something reasonable, I believe the board is basically indicating they will be a little bit more lenient. Yes. So I, I, I definitely agree with you there. I think maybe the, the recourse to take or the takeaway is that simply noting the coronavirus mm-hmm. as a reason not to have the deposition on time will probably not suffice. Right. I think there might have to be something what you mentioned in terms of the doctor is actually sick, right? He actually m- may be admitted, you know, God forbid, uh, because of the virus. Or the doctor cannot locate his records because, you know, <laughs> he doesn't have access to email or his, uh, his, his, staff, his staff can't uh, go in there to send uh, the records. Something has to be a little bit more intense about that because I could also imagine if it's at, if it's at one party's right to cross-examine the other doctor in such an extenuating circumstance I don't see any harm with you know as long as making your you're making the other party aware of what you're doing right. sending records that are available electronically through electronic case file uh, I, I just feel like we shouldn't necessarily be ready to postpone or cancel depositions just because an alleged issue with the virus outbreak no absolutely i think that we need to stay on top of our depositions as we always do and schedule them ahead of time but in the event that we do need to request an extension due to a doctor's availability it could simply be mentioning that the doctor was unavailable because he has other um, obligations at this time like if the doctor has an obligation at his hospital or if he has an obligation to additional patients or if he's performing additional examinations, we just need to be able to communicate well with the vendors to ensure that we have the actual reasons for the delays um, so that our affidavits are more robust. Yeah, uh, which kind of leads us to appeals. Uh, appeals is the next thing that the board talked about in their response. And we know that uh, if an appeal is going to be uh, timely, right, we know that there's a deadline associated with that mm-hmm. uh, and obviously if we can't make that deadline just like everything else we've discussed here there should be an affidavit uh, regarding the um, extenuating circumstances so with this particular uh, issue the board said the affidavit must include and indicate that all staff including attorneys and support staff are working remotely or indicate there is no notary in the office so there is no ability for the staff person serving the application rebuttal to obtain notarization and that the legal representative directed the staff person to serve the appeal or rebuttal on the listed parties by the method indicated and upon information and belief such service was completed this flexibility does not apply to any circumstances other than described above well the good thing is, is that we don't plan to actually do that, right? right? We're going to file appeals timely with uh, the technology that we're prepared 
uh, to implement and have implemented so that there's going to be no interruption of service. Right. I think that, you know, just because our world outside our doors are changing, it doesn't mean that our, you know, the, the, the service that we're providing is really changing at all. Like the clients are still getting their appeals filed on time because we have a process in place to do so. I can't even imagine what would happen to you if you couldn't serve a timely appeal. You get a little extra around deadlines. So I'm sure <laughs> that this isn't going to change any of our attitudes towards that. Additionally, attorneys can simply just sign an affirmation without the need for a notary public, which I believe is what we plan to continue to do. I think if our whole team is listening, the whole uh, listening to that part that I get a little extra around deadline time will be a nice little chuckle for them. I was being very kind when I described <laughs> you in that way. <laughs> um, but I think it's a good attitude to have. These deadlines are serious, and it's good that we enforce them as, rigor- as rigorously as we do. Okay, the next uh, the next bullet point uh, really talks about the Compliance Bureau. Uh, it's not so much something we need to really go over in too much detail because essentially the statutes that the board is citing here uh, provide for the imposition of penalties for failure to maintain coverage, right? And I think that uh, we're probably facing a lot of other issues that we can't even comprehend Mm -hmm. if the coronavirus impedes the facilitation of workers' compensation coverage uh, to an employer or that it prevents a policy from running to provide benefits to a claimant. Uh, I would imagine, though, that the the board saying they will consider applications to excuse delays and defaults in complying with the timelines to seek redetermination of the penalties assessed with this, but ultimately... uh, it's pretty straightforward understanding here. Uh, if you don't have coverage for a particular accident or a particular employee that's not reported, uh, it's, it's a big boo-boo that uh, has greater uh, implications other than um, compliance. Yeah. Uh, they basically say that uh, employers may make an application t- uh, for numerous penalties to be redetermined. Uh, an all novel coronavirus related application to excuse a delay or default should be mailed to uh, a PO box in Binghamton, New York. For these specific applications, they must be filed within 14 business days of the deadline date. So, just a little, you know, added note uh, 14 business days from the deadline if you're going to reference coronavirus. And that brings us to our final point. It's actually payer compliance, which uh, we do discuss from time to time. And I think it really has to uh, be talked about in the sense of of accepted claims that don't have medical evidence of to substantiate lost time, right? Payer compliance dictates that uh, you can pay without liability – indemnity benefits for the first 30 days after the accident. Uh, and it's really designed to uh, make sure that you know someone who is totally hospitalized but hasn't produced the hospital records for that particular visit right. gets compensation. Uh, you know, it's not the, the finger sprain, I didn't go to a doctor for 30 days, even though that gets lumped in. Uh, but when the board issues a penalty... They basically say that the application to excuse a delay for payer compliance, again, must be an affidavit form, and that it was caused by conditions over which the applicant had no control, including a statement indicating the date the applicant filed the late document or paid the late compensation, and it's another similar 14 business day turnaround from the deadline from where uh, the payment should have been made. I think it's a lot easier if we're dealing with electronic denials. You know, we we do have a lot of clients that work from home already, right, and work remotely. Uh, Being up to date on payer compliance just gets you out of penalties altogether, right? I think that's the safest way to go about it. Uh, Know your deadlines. The 1810 rule applies to most 
accepted claims. So, uh, well, technically it applies to all claims, uh, but it's a lot easier to kind of get rid of the requirement and denied claim because you're not paying anything. Uh, so accepted claims is where you have to be careful. So through nine bullet points, what would you say is probably the, the biggest one we've talked about? One, one that you know our clients could say, let me just fast forward to the end where Christian and Andrea give a summary uh, and let I, me take that one point. I think the two big uh, takeaways two. Okay, two. or recommendations is – uh, first, the 90-day uh, requirement for medical records is going to be relaxed, but that does not mean that we should let our guard down or not file those RFA-2s. We should get a response from claimant and put them in a position where they have to indicate the reason for their failure to go to the doctor once every three months. Four times a year is not a high burden to meet. And the second is with the IMEs. We should continue to schedule them and we should continue to keep them unless the claimant calls and asks to cancel for a coronavirus-related reason, in which case we should submit an affidavit or a letter from the vendor indicating the reason for the cancellation so that we don't get penalized for the claimant's uh, failure to or refusal to appear. Yeah, that's, that's, I, that's definitely the main one. If anything is going to be uh, excused due to the coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, just mentioning it might not be enough, right? What are the specific circumstances associated with uh, your particular doctor? Uh, and essentially, uh, can you use that to get the relief that you seek? Um, the only thing I would add to that, I guess, is the uh, telemedicine aspect. I'm very excited to see what the board's going to uh, describe as part of their new process, especially if they're only going to let it be possible for 90 days. Uh, I definitely want to kn- um, be aware of that. So if any of you listeners are similarly interested, please uh, let us know uh, that you want our opinion because who doesn't want my opinion on stuff, right? Oh, yeah. um, well, for my guest, Andrea Abudai, who said I am a little extra around uh, deadline time, uh, my name is Christian Sison. Reminding you to defend from day one.